Okay, welcome to this next uh, presentation. My name is Stefan Bink. I'm uh, responsible for IT and operation at Eagles Bank. I we'll have this uh, presentation ready with Samuel Leubel. He is from our partner company from Implementation Part of Tech Shopping. I will start with uh, the business case, the reasoning why Microbank is doing this. One sheet about Migros Bank. Uh, we are fully owned by Migros. Most of you might know Migros. I know. <laughs> Most of many of you might know Migros Bank. We are a medium-sized uh, bank in Switzerland. We cover all of Switzerland. So if you see here these uh, 67 branches, uh, four of them are in the Italian part of Switzerland. Uh, Italian speaking and uh, 16 are in the French speaking part of Switzerland. It's important because we do have to do the translation. I think the reason behind that. See so our, our, our customer base, our employees, and uh, our need for translation is obvious because as a, as a bank that covers all of Switzerland, only for a legal reason we have to cover all the, the different languages. We don't cover English. That's an other. Uh, there are other um, regulatory reasons why we don't do it, but I'm not going to into that one here. So what we have to do, we have to cover everything in Switzerland. We are, we are translating everything from German to, to Italian and to French, like uh, all the applications, manuals, uh, processes, directives, all general communication inside the bank, everything that goes outside the bank is always in, the, in those or these three languages. And since everything is produced out of Zurich, it's everything produced initially in German and will then be translated into Italian and to, um, and to French. So the translation cost in Switzerland is, is considerably high. And uh, if you see on the next page, we do about 6,000 pages per year. With these standards cost, it's about six, 700,000 francs that initially went to, um, to external language service providers. And uh, in 2016, uh, after reorganization, we decided to do it in-house. Reorganization, before the, the responsibility for all these translation services was in marketing. Marketing loves to work with agencies, marketing loves uh, creativity, marketing loves all these kinds of stuff. They came to operation to my responsibility. We are more into cost saving, we are more into technology. So that was actually the reason why we said we want to invest in technology and we want to insource it. Because there's enough external cost to build a, a solid business case, we go into that. Reasons that I said, cost saving, this is clear, but also improved quality. If you work with external agencies, the, the specific words that are being translated, bank terms that are translated from German to French or German to Italian, they're can be translated different. I'm not saying wrong, but they're not, they're not uniform. Translation different. And with, with an internal team, you can much better guarantee that the same term is always translated into the same, um, into the same target language term. And acceleration. If you work with external, uh, uh, external agency, the processes, they, are, they take some time. Uh, of course, you can scale. If you have an internal team, you scale less, but you are much faster when it's really important, when it's really urgent. So, uh, 2017, we built up this in-house team, 2.8 FT, so three, three person. And uh, we introduced uh, the first step, first technology was this computer-aided translation tool uh, with a corresponding translation memory, which we started to build up. We had some initial translation from before, machine readable, that we could uh, fill into this translation memory. And we could hand about 40% of the, of the transaction volume. Problem is that, why is that so low? Because the, the volume is not like this during the year, but it's like this. So I mean, the internal resources, they really cover only the base volume, whatever, every, um, every peak goes, goes outside still today, but we'll see after it's could increase. <laughs> Goal was if machine, machine translation increase the volume that we can handle with the in-house team. And uh, we decided to use a machine translating system to, um, to reach these goals. Now, what is the challenge in that respect is the data privacy. Their offerings, 
uh, from Google, from DeepL, but if you read this one from Google, uh, you don't even have to go until the end, probably you'll see it's not acceptable for a Swiss bank to be bound to the, uh, to the banking privacy laws, and uh, let alone that this data will even go outside Switzerland as well. So for those who doesn't know it, the uh, data privacy law says that no client data is allowed to leave Switzerland, We're actually allowed to leave the bank, let alone Switzerland. <laughs> So the requirements were, as I said, the data privacy, no tax to leave the company network. Of course, there are, there are, there are, there are texts that are not sensitive. So if uh, a man will how to use uh, an application, this is not actually sensitive. But there's a lot of client-related data as well that is being translated. And of course, this is, uh, this is uh, a sensitive and this falls under the data privacy laws. Means as well that we have to do the, the, the training and the deployment, the training of the neural network. So we'll go to that in a minute by somewhere. We have to do the same house. Was our first, uh, was our first uh, artificial intelligence application. So we had to buy for this project some, uh, some cheap GPUs to do this. Now, uh, since uh, uh, we have them, we have other opportunities to use them as well. But they were primarily purchased for this project. Quality should be comparable to market leaders. Um, our benchmark, or my benchmark, because I was at that time the responsible person, I said I want to have it on a similar level as DeepL. And um, problem, one of the problems using this uh, artificial intelligence uh, system is you cannot really do a, an easy proof of concept. So like you can go and invest a little bit of money and then have you have a proof of concept and you can deduct that it will work for a larger scale as well. So this thing is really, uh, you have to build up the neural network until the end to, uh, and to train it, uh, to, uh, to, make, uh, to make a clear estimation if, you, uh, if it fulfills your requirements. So proof of concepts don't work. So we had a, a, a contract, actually in the contract we had, uh, we had some clauses that uh, guaranteed the bonus and model system, the, the quality of the end. Yeah, you're based on promises, you know, you say, yeah, this will work, it will be better than, uh, or at least as good as, uh, as we uh, But it wasn't that easy. <laughs> yeah, in house terminology is important uh, that we have this unique, I said it before. And of course, we want to have this. Uh, time saving as well in the, in the translation to, uh, to save money overall. So we're going into technology. This is more the domain of uh, Zellweb. And uh, your questions on my part have to do in the end as well. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll be happy to share some parts related to technology. Is this too loud for you guys or is that working all right? Okay, cool. Um, so, neural machine translation, how do you build the neural machine translation systems? I'm sorry to repeat this for the people in here who know very well. Um, basically, um, a machine translation system is um, a machine that learns to imitate human translations, right? So when we build data-driven systems, we actually need lots of translated sentences, and then, of course, a learning algorithm. You could use a neural network, for example and some settings, if you will, these are referred to as hyperparameters, right? These have to be tuned and optimized. And as Stefan said, um, in this training phase, you actually need expensive specialized hardware, graphical processing units, graphics processing units, GPUs. Um, but then once you build such a system, you trained it, you get a so-called translation model. This is the model you actually use to translate new text, right? This is the application, it's the decoding step. Well, here you don't necessarily need this anymore. So this is maybe important for the people who are interested in these technologies and you know don't want to spend uh, lots of money on, on GPUs. If you can do the training externally, that's actually perfectly possible um, to run uh, well these models on regular hardware in the end. Now, um, the model architecture we use was um, uh, quite a standard um, at the time. This is a, a bidirectional recurrent neural network and code decoder architecture uh, that was actually very successful at a large research competition back in 2017. Um, it's not the state of the art in machine translation anymore now. People use transformer networks. Um, I guess you've, you've heard of these. Um, but nevertheless, um, in practice, well, quality actually, well, the difference isn't necessarily that big. 
especially if the training data, well, the translations you use to train a system, um, well, if the Syrian data is limited. And that was one of the big challenges in this project, of course. Um, Microbank had, um, well, translations in-house. Translation agencies were producing translations before. Um, but this was roughly 400,000 sentences for French, uh, German to French, and then half of that for German to Italian. So this is not enough to train a good machine translation system. When you want to train a good machine translation system, you need millions of translated sentences, well, millions ideally. Um, so we basically combined the translations that Migrobank acquired or gathered in-house with out-of-domain data, as we say, um, publicly available translations on the internet, pretty much. And of course, you need some filtering there. We don't really have time to go into details here. Uh, if you're interested, please just come and talk to me afterwards. And then we actually use the very simple means of what we call the main adaptation, right? So of course, if you have a translation system for a bank, for Microbank, for example, you want to make sure that translations in this in-domain material are actually preferred in the end, right? So there's a lot of techniques you can use there. What we chose was really we just oversampled this data, basically. So when we trained the system, we just showed these in-domain translations more often to the translation system, if you will, in the learning phase. Um, so data privacy is very important. So we did this whole training inside the Bank network. We also wanted to deploy that afterwards. Um, this is actually something I don't want to cover in too much detail here. Basically, what we did is we just um, packaged these translation engines, if you will, into Docker containers. Um, and this actually, well, this can be deployed on commodity servers. You don't need GPUs anymore here. And of course, the idea is that you don't have to allocate lots of compute resources, but then when you have well demand for big amounts of text uh, to translate that with, uh, without lots of latency, you can easily scale up um, well, you know, the, the processing power you have with your machine translation system on premise. More importantly, maybe, uh, quality. And you mentioned it uh, before, Stefan. So yes, we had this quality um, requirement um, in the initial contract. Um, we actually did a blind comparison with uh, one of the market leaders, uh, DeepL. Um, and what we compared to DeepL was the initial version of these uh, German to French and German to Italian versions. Really. So after the project, uh, well, roughly five months of implementation time, we actually did this test. Uh, 400 sentences were blindly tested by four translators per language pair. And what they did was a relative ranking. This is important. So people, well, basically, this is an example, not with the data we use in the test, but it's just what raters saw in this test. So you see the source sentence, and then you see two translations. Of course, like the order is randomized. And one translation was produced by the Microbank system, in this case, the other by DeepL. And then the options you have is you say A is better, B is better, or they're equal. They're equally good or equally bad. That's actually also important to say. So the target here to reach was defined as 60% better or same as DeepL. And you see it here, it was, it was really, really close. So <laughs> again, this is to say this was before any sort of retraining or whatever. So what you could basically say with this initial version, uh, the system was in, in six out of 10 sentences. You get something which is as good as or even better than DeepL. Now, this is good to know, and I guess it was a validation of the project uh, in the first step, but then um, it's important to know that, well, in a use case where human professional translators are involved, the quality of the output doesn't necessarily translate into productivity. It's not necessarily the same. So this is just a very small example of what people actually do when they work mach with machine translation output. Why does it make translators faster? Well, it's because a machine will, of course, give you a draft translation. Sometimes this is perfectly valid, sometimes it's horrible. And then what people do is they just adjust this, uh, well, this machine translation output, right? So the assumption is that this will be, on average, it will be faster than translation from scratch, so without using this machine translation suggestion. Um, so um, productivity in the end for the business case was the primary measure of interest, of course. Um, I said it, machine translation quality doesn't necessarily equal translator productivity. Why is this? Well, 
A translation by some system might be stylistically a bit more elegant, say, so maybe it's more fluent even. But if it lacks, you know, if, if the, some terminology is wrong in the translation, for example, or like you have formatting that people have to correct manually, this can actually take you a lot of time. So maybe style is in some cases not as important as, well, formal correctness, stuff like that. So what we evaluated, um, we actually conducted a productivity test, a uh, pretty controlled setting where translators translated four texts in two conditions. One was really with the computer-aided translation tool that Stefan mentioned, so machine translation was not included, but people had access to translation memories, turn bases, everything else. They could go to the internet if they wanted. And in the other condition, they used machine translation on top. Um, we have to note here that people actually knew the system, so it wasn't completely new when we tested productivity. People had been working with the system for roughly three months before then and had received some training. So this was really the setup. Um, as I said, two people per language direction. This is not a very big number of participants, of course, and yeah, you see it afterwards when you take averages, this will have some implications. Um, so these are the results, uh, or were the results in terms of speed. Um, I apologize for this is actually quite small here, and you should know the different x-axis that's at Horton. I'm going to come back to this. Um, so basically in terms of speed, what you can see, the orange dots, this is the, well, the words per hour you can achieve with machine translation, the blue dots are without machine translation. Um, so I think briefly we can really see two things here. Um, Machine translation will certainly not speed translators down, right? It's not, it's not necessarily the case that, like here for example, that machine translations will always give you a speed up. Maybe sometimes people won't actually be faster, but it won't make them slower. And on average, they can be quite a bit faster. I'll show the summary later. And then here you see these extreme values in a sense. This is really remarkable. We were surprised about this um, uh, ourselves. So in, in German to French, for example, the fastest, speed, the fastest speed measured without machine translation was around 650 words per hour. It was actually double that speed with um, machine translation. Really, this is not to say that this is always the case, but machine translation for human translators can allow um, very, very fast translation in some cases. Now, um, these improvements in speed, they are obviously meaningless if the output is worse in the end. And that's actually a concern that translators have a lot, you know, have expressed uh, frequently and they're still expressing it. Um, the argument goes, well, if I correct this broken output and, and make it a translation, I just fix errors, people would actually notice in the end. And of course, neither of clients shouldn't be like, well, okay, this, this doesn't sound fluent anymore. So what we did is um, the translations that were produced in this study, in this productivity test, we handed them over to two experts per language pair, actually lecturers at Zeta here. Um, and they blindly scored these translation products. Um, and you see the scores they assigned to these translations here. Um, we could go into details here, um, don't really have the time for this, but then the overall impression, I guess the takeaway here is that, well, for French, it really just didn't make a difference. So experts couldn't tell blindly well, which was like one was better than the other, something. It was just the same quality. And basically, that helped for Italian too, but there, um, well, it was even a bit better with post editing. And this is actually consistent with other um, studies on post editing quality and, and productivity. So, this is just a summary of results. Um, and I want to point you to one thing here, namely the difference between German to French and German to Italian. So you see this is marked. This is actually a marked difference. Um, we haven't um, well conclusively analyzed this yet, but I think uh, two things are important to notice here. Um, so first of all, productivity varies a lot between human translators, even without machine translation. And then when people switch to using machine translation, it affects them in different ways. Some need more training, some need less training. Some use the speed gains to actually just finish a job faster. Others will just, you know, okay, I have more time, so I can actually mingle around with the sentence more and make it stylistically more pleasing. So um, this is why translated training is very important here. And then it also varies between target languages. Actually, the German to French system was found to be better at that time. and. 
when you think back to the very beginning, I mentioned that we had half as much in-domain data available for the German to Italian system as compared to the German to French system. Um, and the interesting thing is that compared to DeepL, the difference was actually still the same. And so like people who tested DeepL um, itself more, um, uh, well, concretely, actually told us, well, look, even in DeepL, the German to Italian translations aren't as good as the German to French translations. So the people from Migro, like in Austin Jatsko, for example, looking into this. Um, so yeah, less training material available, um, well, less quality in the end. I guess that's the takeaway here. All right, and I'll give it back to Stefan for the conclusions. Yeah, some of that you've heard already um, in terms of machine translation. Um, it's bad you saw the results. I'm just going to two of these things here. One, uh, uh, we have now 60% of the overall volume to, uh, translated in house compared to 40 before. So that was one important goal as a productivity increase in the cost saving. Important is this one, something we never thought about in uh, the beginning. Now we can give uh, machine translated, pre translated sentences to, to our, uh, to our uh, language, pro uh, to our um, the uh, language service providers. The language services. service providers, thank you. And uh, they have to uh, be paid them less, of course, because they also have to do all the post editing. So we give them like a translated, machine translated uh, text already, and then it gets uh, cheaper. Quality improvements, that's what uh, someone mentioned before, important for me there is also we don't get any more complaints from the Italian and from the French partner of the bank. Because translation is something very, uh, very um, sensitive, uh, very sensible. It's, uh, it's something that uh, people are dedicated about because uh, we, uh, there are minorities in, within Switzerland and everything that comes from Zurich has to be good in everything, <laughs> especially in translation sense. So for me, not only the figures are showing that we have a good quality there, but also the, uh, the reactions. And one more thing, um, sorry, I think is important. Uh, when we started this, our indoor in-house translation team, they were not actually waiting for this. They were saying, hey, I was hired and my contact is written translator. It's not written post-editor. So there were some reservations at the beginning. Now that the people work, are working with it and they see how much interest this creates outside the bank, so we have like uh, several, uh, uh, several demonstrations as well to other companies that are interested in this. Now they feel this is something uh, something good and something that cannot be stopped. I mean, I said at the time when I heard this, like 10 or 15 years ago, we were typing pay slips into our into our uh, banking system. Now we actually, not now, since 10 or 15 years, we scan them. So uh, nobody in, in, in the payment division, the payment uh, operation is saying, I, I was not hired to, uh, to uh, do this, and now it's, it's done by a scanner. So it's the same here, yeah? This is just progress, and uh, it's it's now fully adopted by the by the translator team, and it's really for me it's really a success story, in quality and in cost. So that's it. <laughs> Actually, some market solutions, some solution of a market that you can install on premise instead of retraining a model. I didn't get it, but you understand. Do you mean now? Can you make it louder? Or? Sorry, uh, did you consider at the beginning of the project to uh, use a, a, a solution from the market instead of retraining a model, solution of the market that you can install on premise? I mean, we have that you can install on premise. Yes. Okay, I wasn't aware of any such solution actually. <laughs> There's not many. <laughs> and, and going just uh, to the API of Google or to uh, or DeepL was out of question yeah, because of the uh, 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 issues. Uh, have you considering uh, offering the system also to break down the language barrier within the company? Let's say offering a machine translation for. Uh, German speaker who need to read the French document or something like that on the internet, for example. Just a uh, very quick idea. Yes, yes and no. So <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. For German to French and German to Italian, we are have a pilot running right now. 
that is open in the internet for a limited number of views to see how the system reacts, how the quality is. But the other way around, French to German or Italian to German is not possible because we have no train network. Okay. Okay, I have a problem with that. Then the, the, the volume is small, you know? Yeah. The volume is too small there. Because to train another another network for the other direction is, is not cheap, you know? Okay. There's no business case. I, I do have a question about... Uh, so I have, I have like a question. I have been, been missing the information about how to um, you continuously train your models. I mean, mm -hmm. you are using the model to... Um, Generate translation. You are editing them, and then what do you do afterward? You use these, you know, the final product of the translation to retrain the model to enhance the, the uh, quality of the translation again. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, but it's important to know that this is a periodical process, right? So, what you do is you have well, you have your machine translation output. People post that it, it gets you perfect translations. So over time, you'll accumulate more better in-domain translations. And then periodically, uh, well, we agreed on four months for now, we'll actually just retrain the system using this new material. So there is a delta in between. And periodically, that means also automatically. I mean, uh, it is going to trigger, I mean, the, the, the training is going to be triggered automatically. Automatically, or not really. It's okay. not. It's not fully automated. This has several reasons. Also, because the CAD tools, they actually, it's easier to get data in than data out to automate stuff and something like that. And um, but also, we wanted to make sure. And this is maybe an advantage of, of like working with with like a, a local provider in that sense. If we come back to your question too, like we actually we can talk to the translators, right? I guess that's they're in a kind of lucky position, I'd say. If they tell us, you know what, with, with numbers, with uh, IBAN numbers, whatever, I always have this certain problem, but well, we could really treat the training. So we don't only take the new translations, we actually, we would adjust, you know, maybe sometimes simple rules are needed, for example, so we would then add them as well. Uh, do, you, do you have some, some, some figures about, you know, whether these continuous training is, um, is um, enhancing the model? Do you, do, do you notice some, some, some quality uh, um, increase? We have, we have no figures, but we have uh, the statements of the translator. They say after retraining, we felt and we, we see the improvements. And also maybe internally, we do have automatic measures like metrics, but this is doesn't always translate into productivity, right? So of course we do measure blue and stuff like, you know, on test sets, but yeah. question, how do you monitor the performance of the translator? I mean, it takes four months for retraining. Do you monitor the performance whether it drops or not? And if it drops dramatically, would you do a spontaneous, let's say, training? Have you considered that? Uh, I mean, if it dropped dramatically, I would have a phone call. <laughs> 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 and, you know, uh, no, I mean, uh, so far, we did how much? We did one retraining so far. Two, no two actually. Uh, we're on the third now. Yeah, oh, so okay. two are rolled out. Third is happening now. Yeah. And it never happened. That's not yet. So you don't automatically monitor the performance as it goes without the retraining for these four months. I mean, then you'd have to like track translators very actively. I'm not sure if they would really like it. You know, like we, we don't measure like speed when they translate and stuff. I guess most importantly, it was like really like translator satisfaction, and that if the numbers, you know, say that that's okay. If the output overall like increases, that should be fine. Yeah. Another question: Did you? I mean, right now you went for this NLP approach as a second opinion or a helping function that you your translator. Did you have a statistical? Uh, machine translation approach before, or you went straight towards the NMT approach? No, we didn't have anything before. As I said, we took it over from marketing, and we had to start bringing technology into it. First was the Kabul, Kabul data translation, that was the second step. Am I right that you are focusing on language learning and improving the training data and not the architecture? You could say so in a sense. I mean, we might do some tweaks to the architecture here and there, um, but this is not foundational research, right? So this is actually application of what's been shown to be successful, uh, like in research settings, on the architecture side. But then the devil is really in the detail, I can assure you. So like training data and stuff, you know, quotation marks, non-breaking spaces, these things matter to human translators who actually use the systems, right? But, but this is your idea. Okay. Um, 
periodic retraining, meaning GPUs are standing there doing nothing? Did you, well, nothing you said, maybe there are some other use cases, but did you take that into consideration when you actually made the decision of buying these GPUs to do the on-premise training? No, we bought it. Uh, I was confident that we'll find our application okay. for it. <laughs> <laughs> and that works, right? So you have now a, a system that can be shared, or? And we have other cases at the moment that will uh, require it. Okay, last question. Uh, Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, how long does the training last? You mean the actual training, once we have all the data? Like training itself, it's four days, maybe. Four to five days. Do you think it would make sense to train continuously? Like after four days, train a new one, including automating everything? I, I don't think the data is big enough here. You know, if you have three people, four people working, not even full time, it's two point eight full time positions. You don't generate so much more words. I mean, it could be helpful if you have a you know a project or a certain word, for example, a certain translation. You know, is repeatedly used, and then people are frustrated because like, oh, it's wrong again, it's wrong again. But this is doesn't happen regularly, I'd say. Okay. We'll take it offline. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much again for the closing.